Welcome, Gun Runner. One thing that always made arcade games special when compared to the titles we played at home was the advanced technology inside them. It wasn't until the late 90s that we started to see consoles and computers that could match the hardware used to play the latest and best coin ops. There were times over the years however that the biggest arcade manufacturers looked towards the technology found in the home market and tried to find ways to exploit it for their own products. In this video we are going to be looking at home computer based arcade games in particular with five such examples of popular micros turned into coin crunching coin ops. Let's see how many of these you remember playing over the years. It is a cacophony of sounds from a symphony of electronics. If you're filling your time capsules these days, don't forget a bit of Frogger, or Mousetrap, or Grand Champion, or Pac-Man, or Ms. Pac-Man. They are video games. They are as American, well, as international as war. We've got that too. Exidy were a company that had already had huge success in the arcade with titles such as Death Race, Crossbow and Venture, and were also responsible for releasing the very first coin-up machine based on home computer hardware. In 1984, arcade operators were still recovering from the North American arcade game crash. This was a different thing to the more well-documented consumer crash that affected the home console market, and was caused by arcade operators being stuck with old and unfashionable machines that they couldn't get rid of leaving them unable to make more money and purchase new ones. This was very much the key reason interchangeable arcade systems came into the fore in the first place. So Exidy came up with a Maxiflex system designed to save both themselves and arcade operators money by offering an easy and cheap upgrade solution. Whilst the outside of the cabinet would look like any other in the arcades, the insides were very very different. At the heart of the Maxiflex was an Atari 600 XL computer connected to a special board that controlled the length of time you could play each game. This concept would later be copied by Nintendo for their own NES based play choice system. So rather than playing until you died, you would simply play until your time ran out. Adding additional coins at any point would of course extend this time. The Atari 600 XL was the perfect choice as it had 16k of memory with advanced graphics and sound as well as a cartridge port and expansion bus. Exidy teamed up with First Star Software to provide the games, with home hits Boulder Dash, Bristles, Flip and Flop and Astro Chase being made available. The Maxiflex proved pretty popular with arcade operators in America, especially when they discovered that you could in fact use any normal Atari 8-bit game with the system, allowing them to update their game selections very easily. This also caused Exidy to stop supporting it though, as operators stopped buying the new games and marquees from them and only wanted the more costly and labour-intensive hardware instead. Now Double Dragon, the highest acclaimed martial arts game of all time, is available for your home computer from Melbourne House. Skillful programming has taken the superb graphics and addictive gameplay of the monster arcade hit and faithfully reproduced it in home computer versions. Join in deadly combat with the savage street gang of the infamous Shadow Boss. Use whatever weapons come to hand as you pursue the gang through the slums, factories and wooded outskirts of the city to reach the Black Warrior hideout for the final configuration with the Shadow Boss himself. Use the many different offensive and defensive moves, all the arcade weapons and take your favorite opponents in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Double Dragon from Melbourne House for your computer now. If you lived in the UK in the 80s and owned a home computer, then you'd be more than familiar with the name Mastertronic. They were one of the true pioneers of budget price games alongside the likes of Codemasters and Firebird and became hugely successful almost overnight. This success led them to diversify into other sectors such as releasing full price games via the Melbourne House label and after a merge with Virgin Games they became the official distributors for the Sega Master System in the UK and France. 
After becoming dominant in both the computer and console sectors, there was only one place left to go, the arcades. And in 1987, they did just that by setting up arcade systems in California with the intent to create an interchangeable arcade system based on the Commodore Amiga 500 computer. Alongside the Amiga would be a custom chassis that would enable arcade operators to slot in jammer style boards with the games on. Arcadia cabinets would be available in two varieties, standalone cabs and selector units featuring multiple games. There would be a grand total of 18 different games developed for the Arcadia system that comprised of existing Amiga games converted into coin ops such as Xenon, Ninja Mission and Leaderboard as well as newly developed titles like R, Road Wars and Magic Johnson's Fast Break that would appear in arcade form first before being converted to home systems. Unfortunately, the project was a huge failure for Mastertronic, with the US division posting huge losses because of it. According to former Mastertronic employee Anthony Guta, the games were poorly received by arcade operators, who felt they were severely lacking compared to rival coin ops. He went on to say that Mastertronic's game designers knew how to make great budget games, but these were ill-suited to arcades, and he knew the project would fail from day one. <coughs> The name Sega is as synonymous with arcade games as it is with home consoles. They are one of a select few manufacturers alongside the likes of Atari and Nintendo who have experienced widespread success in both sectors. So it won't come as any surprise to learn that the Japanese giants experimented with putting home console hardware into coin ops on multiple occasions with varying degrees of success, and the first of those was the SG board. This was virtually identical to the hardware found in their own SC3000 computer, and of course the SG1000 home console, which were both released in July 1983 as direct competitors to the Nintendo Famicom. The idea behind this was to make converting the games for home use as easy as possible, but the system proved very unpopular with arcade operators, most likely due to its technically unimpressive nature and only three games were ever released for the SG arcade board in the form of Championship Boxing, Championship Pro Wrestling and Doki Doki Penguin Land. The SG arcade was never released outside of Japan sadly. Believe it or not, the failure of the SG arcade board didn't stop Sega having another go not long after with the System E in 1985, which was closely based on the Master System hardware, the backwards compatible follow-up to the SG-1000. Is advised. You own just one racing game, it has to be Hydra Thunder. You've never seen anything like this. For two players, or one, Hydra Thunder, rated E from Midway. At the heart of every modern arcade game is nothing more than a PC that's no more powerful than the one you have at home. But it was a long time before IBM PC compatibles were even considered for use in arcade games, with the first example coming as late as 1998 in the form of the Atari Media GX system. This used an off-the-shelf PC with a Cyrix Media GX processor and a daughter board that handled graphics and audio generation, which was the only difference between it and a standard home PC. According to former Atari engineers, it was just too underpowered to do anything really groundbreaking with, and that's probably why only one game was ever released that used it, Area 51 Site 4, though two other games did reach the prototype stage in the form of Bloodlust and Shooting World. Around the same time, another arcade giant on the other side of the world dabbled with using PCs too, in the form of Taito and their Wolf system, but again the game's designers found that the Pentium MMX based hardware was unsuitable and only one game was ever released that used it, Psychic Force 2012. The first truly successful PC based arcade hardware was the Midway Quicksilver 2, released in 1999, which powered the hugely popular Hydro Thunder as well as several other games and was based on a Celeron 366MHz CPU and a Quantum Obsidian 3DFX card. From that point on, more and more arcade hardware began to appear based on home PC technology until it became the norm. If you're looking for proof that the world of video games just keeps getting more incredible, wait until you get a load of this. This is Virtuality, the virtual reality entertainment system by Spectrum Holobyte. Now this little coin operated machine is the first of its kind and it is designed to toss you into a true to life world simulated by the computer.
by using what they call a stereoscopic images system. Now this means it produces 3D like you've never seen it before. You see, when you physically turn your head like this, what you see on screen moves and looks just like what you would see if you turned your head in reality like I did. If I were to say this is awesome, let me tell you something, it just wouldn't cover it. Now, virtuality comes in two different hardware configurations. One is a personal arena setup where you stand in an elevated platform, put on a head-mounted display, and hold on to a controller. Now, the other, it's a sit-down unit where you sit in a cockpit, put a head-mounted display on, and use a steering wheel or two hand controllers. This thing is sweet, keeping in mind the hefty price tag of $60,000 for the stand-up and $55,000 for the sit-down version. I think you'll agree that uh, you'll probably won't be playing this incredible system at home. You'll be most likely playing it at the arcade. And do bring a lot of quarters, because with a price tag like that, the gameplay will not come cheap. Here's a look at one of the first games you'll be able to find in this system in the arcades. Commodore's hugely popular Amiga computer has already appeared once in this video as part of the Arcadia system, but here we find it again in undoubtedly the most famous and successful series of coin-ops based on home computer hardware. Although, as a company, virtuality had existed in some shape or form since 1985, developing new ways of using 3D graphics to create interactive environments, they didn't unveil their first consumer VR experience until 1991 in the form of the Virtuality 1000 system. The hardware was powered by a top-of-the-range Amiga 3000 computer with added hardware accelerators and interfaces to communicate with the headset and controllers. The first revisions of the virtuality hardware featured a strictly sit-down environment with rather limited movement, but it wasn't long until the company developed a fully immersive pod with a separate headset and sensors that offered full 360-degree movement. In total, Virtuality developed nine different games that used the 1000CS and 1000SD setups with an Amiga 3000 at their heart, before finding that it was no longer up to the job. For the 2000 series onwards, they switched to using their own custom hardware setups that were built around Intel-based PCs. And that concludes my look at five different arcade systems that were based around home computers. Are there any other examples you can think of, and do you think that there are any other computers that were ideally suited for coin-up cabinets? Please let me know in the comments. But before I go, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible, giving special thanks to the following patrons in particular, Thunder Fundington, John DiLiberto, Carl Olsen, Mark Slorence, Chaotic, Seth Robinson, James Taylor and Cold Air Fusion. If you also want to support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now, where you can get access to a host of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, and I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.